Hello. So I hope you guys enjoyed um, your one week break. And um, you had a little more time to work on the homework as well. So um, if you have any questions about the homework, uh, please contact me and I can explain any questions in um, more detail if you need to. Hello. Hello. Every time we're, we have less and less people. So, um, uh, yeah, I know it's hard. But if you keep going with it, I've said this so many times already, but if you keep going with it, it's only going to get easier from here. Because it's kind of like the mindset or there's a really special kind of process, um, like the problem solving process you would use for physics. It's like different from math, different from any other subject. It's very, um, very unique to physics and I can't really describe it. But the more problems you do, um, the more familiar you will be with that kind of problem solving strategy. And then in the end, um, even with new topics, it's only gonna get easier for you. All right, it's eight o'clock for me at least. And so let me share my screen. PowerPoint for the day. All right, um, maybe I'll wait one more minute. All right, looks like Ryan is here. Hello. Okay, so this week we're going to talk about collisions. And as we know, collisions are um, collisions, right? Stuff that happens when two objects crash into each other. And this is kind of like, you would call this class Momentum Part 2, but since it's all about collisions, um, I've kind of renamed it as the Collisions class. Okay, so we're, all, we're going to be talking about everything that goes on when two things collide to each other. Okay. <clears throat> so the topics are inelastic collisions, 1D elastic collisions, and then 2D elastic collisions. So these are all different types of collisions, and we're going to be going through all three types of these. Okay? So first of all, inelastic collisions. So what are inelastic collisions? Well, somehow we're going to have to use momentum with collisions, right? We got over momentum last week. I said that oh, this is momentum part two. So as we know, collisions happen when two objects crash into each other. For example, this is going this way, this is going that way, and then bam, they've collided. Okay, so that's a collision, if you don't know that yet. And there are lots of different types of collisions that can occur. And one of them is called the inelastic collision. As you can see in the word inelastic, there is the word elastic inside it. And inelastic means not elastic. So when you think of something that's elastic, you think of something that's really bouncy and stuff. So an inelastic collision is where 
these two objects collide and they don't bounce at all. They stick to each other. For example, you might have two blocks, one is moving this way, one is moving this way. They collide and they just stick to each other right here. Okay? And they could stick together and move on in another direction. But what's key to an inelastic collision is that these two objects will stick together and they'll kind of fuse into one um, mega object or, or a bigger object. So in an inelastic collision, these two objects kind of stick together almost like there's glue on them. And the opposite of an inelastic collision is where these two things bounce. Like they would hit each other and then they would bounce off of each other. And in the end, it would look like this. But right now we're gonna focus on inelastic collisions where these two objects are gonna hit each other and just stick to each other, okay? They're gonna act like one object after the collision and they're gonna move together. So what does that mean here? Well, why would they stick together in the first place? Well, there has to be friction here. Friction causes these two objects to stick together. So in an inelastic collision, there has to be friction between these two objects. If it's frictionless, then they're gonna bounce, okay? Friction is the force that's causing these objects to fuse together, all right? So in an inelastic collision, there's friction that exists. In an elastic collision, which we're going to talk about later, there's no friction. There can't be friction. Okay? So since there is friction, what does this mean? Friction creates heat. Okay? So since it creates heat, then energy is not conserved in an inelastic collision. Energy is not conserved. So the initial kinetic energy of the two objects is greater than the final kinetic energy because some of that energy was lost to the heat generated with the friction. So in an inelastic collision, energy is not conserved. But what is conserved is momentum. As you remember from last week or two weeks ago, momentum is conserved when there's no external forces acting between these two objects. Well, when they collide, friction acts on them, but it's an internal force. It's between these two objects. By the third law, friction will do an equal and opposite force on both of the objects. So in the end, these, these forces will cancel out. Okay. Since, there, since there's no external forces acting on these two objects, then momentum will be conserved. Okay. So two things you should note in an inelastic collision where they stick together. First, energy cannot be conserved. Like not 100% of this kinetic energy cannot be all converted into kinetic energy of the final two blocks, okay? Secondly, momentum is conserved. In any kind of collision, if there's no force involved, no external force, then momentum will always be conserved. That's as a result of um, the law of conservation of momentum. So what this means here, we can derive a little simple formula for um, the velocity of these two objects after their collision. So let's label this M1, if it has V1, M2 has V2. Well, let's use conservation of momentum. Initial momentum is M1 V1 plus M2 V2. And this equals to the final momentum. M1 is fused with M2, so M1 plus m2 because they're like they're acting like one big object now going at velocity v so how do we find v v is just m1 v1 plus m2 v2 over m1 plus m2 okay so this is the formula for the velocity of these two objects after an inelastic collision so and i wouldn't really me recommend memorizing this formula What's more important is that you know the conservation momentum. And this is not really that hard to derive. So um, I would just recommend using the conservation momentum. And you won't really need to memorize anything in this scenario. OK? So that's really all you need to know about inelastic collisions. So are there any questions? All right. So before we move on to questions, to problems, I mean. I need to say this one more time. Energy is not conserved in an inelastic collision. If um, a collision is inelastic, you cannot use the conservation of energy.
all right? That's a really, really dangerous mistake that a lot of people do. They see two collisions, they're like, hey, I can use the conservation of energy, right? But no, you can't, all right? So if a, if a collision is inelastic, do not use the conservation of energy. The only thing you can use is conservation of momentum, all right? So let's move on to some problems here. So this shouldn't take that long. So I'll give you guys two minutes to do this one. So once you get your answer, please chat that to me as well. All right, so that's two minutes, and I'll let uh, Max um, give the solution for this problem. So go ahead, Max. Okay, so wait, let me annotate. Okay, so um, so M one and then uh plus. Wait, why is it? Oh, Max, you're muted. Oh, okay. Wait. Wait, it's not working. Okay, so we know that V is 6, 
And then uh, the other velocity is zero. Okay, now that now we know six uh, m equals two m b two. So then we can cancel out the m's. So now it's v2 equals 3. Yeah, that's correct. So what he did here was um, he just used the conservation of momentum. The initial momentum equals the final momentum. Initially, we have just the block m moving at 6. So it's just 6m. That's the initial momentum. And the final momentum is where these two blocks are now moving together. So the combined mass is 2m times their new velocity. And then we just solve for V, which is three. Good job, Max. All right. So another problem here. I'll give you guys um, three minutes for this one. All right, so that will be three minutes for this problem. Um, Max will be explaining it again. Okay, so okay. all right, so um, oh, okay. I'm going to 
So then 5 times 7 plus 3 times 0 will equal to, and then yeah, 5 times yes. that, and then it will just be over it, over 9. Yes. Yep. Exactly correct. And if you were to calculate that, that would be 3.88. So what he did here was he took the initial momentum and that equaled the final momentum, right? No matter what happens in between those collisions, um, momentum is still conserved, right? So it doesn't really matter that the five kilogram block had to stick to the three kilogram block before the one kilogram block. If you just take the initial position and the final position, momentum is still conserved. So he set up an equation in that way and he got the answer, okay? Any questions? All right, so we have these two problems here. Go ahead and spend um, four minutes on these. Actually, let's make that five minutes, okay? Actually, I think um, the first problem is um, uh, an incorrect solution. I don't think it's possible. So um, you guys can skip this one, the first one. One more minute. 
All right, so I'm going to explain this one. So the question is, two crash test vehicles approach each other at a right angle. One vehicle is 4,300 kilograms and moves at eight meters a second, while the other vehicle is 5,600 and moves at 10.2. They collide, they stick to each other, and what is the direction and magnitude of their velocity after the collision? So let's first draw the diagram to make it a little less confusing. So first of all, we have one vehicle. Let's call this V1 with M1, let's say. M1 is moving at V1. And we have M2 moving this way at a right angle at V2. And in the end, a large M1, M2 blob goes off at some kind of angle. OK? So what does this mean? This M1, M2 blob has two components of momentum. It has a horizontal and a vertical component, OK? And these horizontal and vertical components are given by M2, V2 and M1, V1. And these two uh, momentum vectors uh, added together will create the final momentum vector. So we need to add these two momentum vectors together, and they will equal to the final momentum vector. And then we can use that to find our masses. So what we do is we take m1 v1 squared plus m2 v2 squared, and we take the square root of that. Because right, that's the Pythagorean theorem. That's how we add the vectors together. And this will equal to the final momentum vector that the m1 m2 blob has. So this will equal to, let me move this out of the way, m1 plus m2, because they're together now, times whatever velocity they have, all right? And if you were to solve this, you would get 6.74 meters a second. And as for the angle, well, if we just say that um, this is, let me move this out of the way, this vehicle is 4,300, then its momentum vector, which will be horizontal, is 4,300 times 8, 34400 zero, zero, kilogram meters per second. What about the upwards? Well, 5,600 times 10.2, 51, 57120 kilogram meters per second, right? So now we just take the angle, negative tangent of 57120 over 3440. What do we get? Negative tangent. This is around 59 degrees, OK? So it's a 59 degree angle relative to the path of the 4,300 kilogram um, vehicle, okay? So this problem was basically just breaking the momentum down into two components, x and y. Just like anything in physics, momentum is also a vector. So you can add these two vectors together and get what you need, okay? Let's see, we have one last problem with inelastic collisions right here. So spend three minutes doing this one. This one's kind of a momentum plus energy combo problem. So when you get your answer, please chat that to me in the form of centimeters. So like some number of centimeters.
All right, so I'm gonna explain this one now. So the problem says a four kilogram box moves along a frictionless surface at 10 meters a second towards a two kilogram block at rest, which is attached to an unstretched spring of constant 1000. If the collision is inelastic, how far will the spring compress? So at first glance, here is an incorrect solution. So you might say, hey, initial energy equals final energy. So 1 half times 4 times 10 squared equals 1 half times 1,000 times x squared. No, this is not right, because the collision is inelastic. So when the two blocks collide, some friction is going to occur, which will create heat. So energy is not conserved in this problem. So how do we solve it then? Well, let's take this step by step. The first step is before the spring even starts compressing, the two blocks have to collide, right? So let's just pretend the spring isn't there for a moment. It's just a four kilogram block moving towards a two kilogram block at rest. So we just use conservation of momentum. Four times 10 equals the final moment, the final momentum, which is these two blocks have fused together as one of six kilograms times velocity. The eventual velocity is going to be 6.67 meters per second. So right after the collision, like the instant after these two blocks collide, before the spring has even started compressing yet, it is now turned into a six kilogram block moving at 6.67 meters a second. Okay, so we've condensed the problem down to, we've, we've basically done the first problem now, All right? So now we can use energy conservation. Why? Because the collision has already recurred. The friction has already dissipated. All right. And all we have here now is a system that works without any friction. Right. There's no friction between the ground. There's no friction within the spring. All right. So the friction has already occurred here. So now we can use conservation of energy. One half m v squared equals one half k x squared, okay? And in the end, I think your answer should be 52 centimeters, okay? Are there any questions about that? So you can't use conservation of energy to go through this whole problem because the collision is inelastic. So you first determine what will happen after the collision, before the spring even starts compressing, and then you can use conservation of energy. All right, now we've got 1D elastic collisions. We've already talked about inelastic collisions where the two blocks collide and they stick together, all right? In an elastic collision, they bounce, okay? You could think of like two bouncy balls hitting each other and boing, they bounce off of each other, okay? And if you've ever played pool, uh, the game where you try to, this is the board and you, you have like six um, holes here and you try to hit the balls into the holes, right? You could like shoot it like this and it would go off. These, these balls are called billiard balls and they're really smooth, right? And then that's why they bounce. They seem to bounce when you play pool, all right? So this is a real world example of an inelastic, an elastic collision. Okay, so elastic collisions occur without any friction. That's why they bounce, right? They don't stick to each other, right? Because when they stick to each other, there has to be some kind of friction involved. But if they don't stick, then it's completely inelastic. They bounce, okay? Just like the billiard balls. The billiard balls are very smooth and there's no friction, which is why they have el elastic collisions. Unlike inelastic collisions, elastic collisions conserve energy is conserved, okay? Because when they collide, there's no friction. There's no way that heat can ever be generated. So energy is conserved in an elastic collision. And just like the inelastic collisions, momentum will always be conserved. Because with any kind of collision, if there's no external force acting, then momentum has to be conserved, right? There, there can't be a change in their momentum. So what this means is that if we have M1 moving this way at V1, and we have M2 moving this way at V2, and let's just say after the collision, M1 moves this way at V1 prime, 
m2 moves this way at v2 prime. The two equations we can develop from here is that since energy is conserved, the initial energy equals the final energy. 1 half m1 v1 squared moves out of the way. Plus 1 half m2 v2 squared equals 1 half m1 v1 prime squared plus 1 half m2 v2 prime squared. Okay, so first of all, energy is conserved. And the second equation we can make is that momentum is conserved. M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 V1 prime plus M2 V2 prime. So those are two equations we can use to problem solve. And there's one last equation that's really special to a 1D elast elastic collision. In a 1D elastic collision, what's really special about this is that V1 minus V2 equals V2 prime minus V1 prime in a 1D elastic collision. So these are three equations you can use for a 1D elastic collision. And you're not really going to use the energy equation that much because honestly, who wants to do that much math, right? It's too, too complicated. It's too much stuff to consider. So usually you're just going to use these two equations here. You're going to have the, the conservation of momentum, and then you're going to have the velocity equation for a 1D elastic collision. So to um, kind of explain this um, equation here, for example, let's just say V1 was going at five meters a second, and then V2 was at three meters a second. Then if we set a positive and negative, then V2 is negative three, okay? So then V1 minus V2 is eight. That's the difference, five minus negative three. And eight is gonna be equal to V2 prime minus V1 prime. So whatever V2 prime is, if we subtract that from V1 prime, that's gonna to equal to eight, all right? So these are the, these two are kind of the key equations you're gonna use for um, a 1D elastic collision, okay? But when we later get into 2D elastic collisions, the, the second equation here is not gonna be valid. This is only valid for a 1D elastic collision. So it's really important that you write these equations down, okay? Does anyone need more time to write these down? Okay. We have two more equations with 1D elastic collision. All right. So there's a really common problem where we have mass one going at V1, and then we have mass two at rest. You're going to see this kind of problem a lot. So um, you can, I'm going to explain some shortcuts you might use to solve this problem. Of course, you could use the conservation momentum along with the V1 prime minus V2 prime equals V2 minus V1. You can swap like that. You could use that, but there's a shortcut, two shortcut equations you can use for this certain type of scenario. This only works if V2, if the second mass is at rest before the collision. So what the two equations are is after the collision, let's say M1 goes at V1 prime, M2 goes at V2 prime. The equations are that after the collision, the speed of M1, which is V1 prime, equals to M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2 multiplied by V1. So write this guy down. This is the velocity of the initial ball after the collision. Velocity of the second ball, V2 prime, equals 2m1 over m1 plus m2 times v1. That's the velocity of the second ball after the collision. So the second ball is the ball that's initially at rest, and the first ball is the ball that's initially moving. All right, so these are two equations you would use for this certain scenario where the, both the, um, the collision is 1D and the collision is elastic, and also one of the balls has to be at rest before the collision. Okay, so these are two important equations you might want to write down. Alrighty, so let's do some problems. We have two problems here. So once again, um, let me give you guys four minutes to do this one. How about five? Five minutes. <laughs> 
So if you need a refresher on the equations, I'm going to write them here. So first of all, for any kind of 1D uh, inelastic, 1D elastic equation, 1D elastic um, collision, actually, you have V1 minus V2 equals V2 prime minus V1 prime. This, is, this works for any kind of 1D elastic. And then for the special case scenario where two, um, one of the balls is at rest before the collision, then V1 prime is equal to M1 minus M2 for M1 plus M2 V1. And then V2 prime equals 2M1 over M1 plus M2 times V1. So V2 has to be the, uh, the resulting velocity of the ball that wasn't moving initially. And then V1 is the velocity of the ball that, you, or that was moving before the collision, okay? So V2 was not moving initially. And then V1 is moving. All right, one more minute. 
All right, so I'm going to explain these two problems now. So the first problem is a ping pong ball moves along a frictionless surface at six meters a second, then it collides elastically with an identical ping pong ball initially at rest. What are the velocities after the collision? Well, let's first draw a, a diagram to help us. So this is the initial position. Let's just say that ping pong ball has mass m. It's going at six meters a second. Initially, the other ping pong ball is at rest. Then in the end, we want to find out, hey, what's the velocity of uh, initial ping pong ball, and then what's the velocity of the second ping pong ball? Be two prime. So we just use the equations we have for um, in the case that one of the objects is at rest before the collision. So the eventual um, velocity of the first ball is given by m m1 minus m2, and they're the same over m plus m times v1. Well, m minus m is just a zero. That turns everything into zero. So the first ball actually stops. Its velocity is zero meters a second after the collision. Now for the second one, v2 prime is equal to two times m1 over m plus m times v1. Well, two m over m plus m is just one because they're the same thing. So v2 prime equals v1. So that means that v2 prime is six meters a second. So what do you know here? If two objects are at, uh, have the same mass and they collide elastically with one of them initially at rest, then the first ball will become at rest after the collision and the second ball will be moving at the initial velocity of the first ball. Okay, that's kind of a shortcut you would use if you ever see a similar problem again. Okay, so now for the second problem, a five kilogram ball moves at five meters a second east. A seven kilogram ball moves at seven meters a second west. If they collide elastically, what are the velocities of the two balls after the collision? So for this problem, we can't use the two handy formulas we had for the first problem because they're both moving initially. So the equations we use is V1 minus V2 equals V2 prime minus V1 prime. For any kind of a 1D, elastic collision, this equation is valid. Let's draw out a little diagram here. So we have a five kilogram ball moving at five and a seven kilogram ball moving at seven. And let's define a positive and negative. Let's just say this is positive, this is negative. So negative seven meters a second. Wait, never mind. Let's just make this plot the positions negative and then this one positive. Okay? So what is let's set this as V1, this as V2. So five minus negative seven equals V2 prime minus V1 prime. 12 equals V2 prime minus V1 prime. So if we, are, we rearrange, we get V2 prime equals um, 12 plus V1 prime. All right. So with that, now we can what we can do is we can use the conservation of momentum equation, which is M1 plus V1, M1, V1 m2 v2 equals m1 v1 prime plus m2 v2 prime. Okay, m1 v1 plus m2 v2, that's just 5 times 5 plus 7 times negative 7. This equals to m1, which is 5 times v1 prime. And then we have this formula here. We, we, ha we have represented v2 in terms of v1. So we can plug in 12 plus v1 prime in as v2 in this equation. So we can have plus 7 times 12 plus v1 prime. Now in this equation, the only unknown we have is v1 prime. So if you solve that, let's see, what do we get? We get v1 prime equals negative 9 meters a second. So this means after the collision, v1 is going to the left now, since this is negative, OK? What does this mean for v2? Well, we can just plug v1 in to this equation here. v2 prime equals 12 plus v1 prime. 12 plus negative 9, v2 prime equals 3 meters a second. Okay, so that's basically the approach for this type of problem. Are there any questions? All right, so we're running a little low on time, so Let's do this problem here. I'll give you guys 
and starting to know how to do it. I'll give you guys three minutes for this one. Wait, actually, let's let's skip this one. Sorry about that. Wait, let's just do this one then. Two minutes for this one. All right, so I'm gonna go over this problem now. So a 0.44 kilogram ball moves east with a speed of 3.3 meters a second, and it collides head on with a 0.22 kilogram ball, um, which is initially at rest. So what are the speeds after the collision? Well, the other ball is at rest. So we can use these two handy dandy formulas we have. V1 prime equals M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2 multiplied by v1, and then v2 prime equals 2m1 over m1 plus m2 times v1. And in the end, we're going to have 1.1 and 4.4. 1.1 .4. meters a second, 4.4 meters a second. You may ask, hey, why isn't one of them not moving, right? In the initial problem, in the other problem we did, one of them stopped moving and the other one went off at the exact same speed initially. Well, that only happens if the two balls have the same mass, okay? But as you can see here in this problem, the two balls do not have the same mass. So you have to use these formulas to find out what they actually are, okay? So since both of these things are positive, they're both going east, one of them at 1.1 and the other one at 4.4. All right, so finally we have two-dimensional elastic collision. So as we can see from the last problem, it said that um, the two balls collide head on. So this means that whenever a, a, an elastic collision is one dimensional, then that means the two objects have to collide head on. If they collide slightly at an angle, like this, and they collide like this, then the collision will be two dimensional. They'll go off at an angle to one another. And this happens a lot in pool, in the game of pool, right? When you hit the ball at a certain angle, then it will go, then the two balls will go off at different angles to one another, okay? So how do we problem solve for a 2D elastic collision? 
Well, from the other um, two-dimensional inelastic collision problem we just did a while back, we added the vectors together, okay? So we added the final two momentums equal to the initial momentum, right? Just conservation of momentum. The final momentum of the two objects equals the initial momentum of the first object, okay? So basically, the final two momentum vectors added together will equal to the initial momentum vector, okay? So um, actually, it might be easier for you to understand how I do this one with an example problem. So let me have this example problem out. So for this example problem, I'm just going to go over, I'll go over it to tell you um, how you would do a 2D elastic collision problem. So a two kilogram ball makes a perfectly elastic collision with another ball at rest. After the impact, the two kilogram ball moves away at a 55.6 degree angle to its original direction. And the unknown, uh, should be ball, unknown ball travels away at a negative 50 degree angle. What was the mass of the other ball? So first of all, we have a two kilogram ball moving this way and it perfectly collides with another ball of mass M. And then the two kilogram ball moves downward at 55.6. The other ball moves upward at 50. Okay, so that's basically what the problem is saying. And so it wants us to find the mass of the other ball. So we use conservation of momentum here. The final momentum of the two objects equals the initial momentum. So these two vectors added together will equal to the initial vector. So how do we add vectors? Let's go all the way back to the vector addition um, class. And how we add vectors is if we put these two vectors where the tip of one vector meets the end of the other. So we kind of move this vector up this way. So it's like this. Then from the bottom of the initial vector to the tip of the second vector, that will be equal to the sum of these two vectors. So this vector is um, uh, resulting um, momentum vector of mass m, and this is the resulting momentum vector of mass 2m, which was right here. It used to be here, I moved it over there. And then if they add together like that, they equal to the big vector, which is the initial momentum of the two kilogram ball. So we basically have a triangle here. Well, how, what, would you, what, would you, what do we do with the 55.6 degree angle? Well, let's draw another parallel line up here. Do some geometry. And that means this angle is 55.6. We have two angles in this triangle. And what are the sides of the triangle? Well, these are momentum vectors. So this side is the momentum of the mass m. So let's call that m times v3. This one is the momentum of this object, 2 times v2. And then since it was going at v1 initially, the final vector, which is the last side of the triangle, this equals 2 times v1. Okay, so v2 is the final moment, the final velocity of the two kilogram ball, and then v3 is the final velocity of the um, the mystery ball. Okay, so we have a triangle here. We have two angles. Well, what do we do now? We can use the law of sines. If you don't know what the law of sines is, in any kind of triangle, let's just say the sides are side A, side B, side C. They are opposite angles. Angle A. Angle B, angle C, then the law of sines states that A over the sine of A equals B over the sine of B equals C over the sine of C. That's the law of sines. And we can use the law of sines in this triangle right here. All right. So we have two angles. We can figure out the last angle by doing 180 minus 50 minus 55.6, which is 74.4, okay? Now we can use the law of sines, 2v1 over the sine of its opposite angle, which is 74.4, equals, now let's do this one, m times v3 over the sine of its opposite angle, sine 55.6, equals, 
2 times v2 opposite to its angle, 2v2 over sine of 50. So we basically use the law of sines right here. So this is basically the, um, the conservation of momentum equation we have for a 2D um, elastic collision. So for any 2D elastic collision, the momentum equation, the conservation of momentum equation, is basically the law of sines right here. Okay. So now what? We can use the conservation of energy here. All right. The problem is for a 2D elastic collision, the, the nice equation we had here, uh, V1 minus V2 equals V2 prime minus V1 prime, this doesn't work for um, a 2D elastic collision. So we have to use the energy equation here. All right. So it seems like I've gone over time. So you can leave if you want right now, but I'm going to finish explaining this problem. Okay. So um, now we're going to use the conservation of energy. So the initial energy, which is just the mass two moving at V1, one half times two times V1 squared equals the final energy. One half times, well, the mass two will go at V2, one half M V3 squared. Okay, so now we have V1, V2, and V3, and M all as our unknowns in this equation. So how do we solve for this? What we do is now we use the conservation of momentum equation to represent each of V3 and V2 in terms of V1. Okay, so we can set V1 as equal to some kind of combination of V2. So let's use these two, 2V1 over sine of 74.4 equals 2V2 over sine of 50. Right, this is an equation. So V1 will equal to sine of 74.4 V2 over the sine of 50. All right, so now we've represented V1 in terms of V2. Now we can do, um, let's see. Actually, let's represent V2 in terms of V1 because we want to substitute everything in. So all we have is V1 left in our equation. Let's do that, V1 times the sine of 50 over the sine of 74.4 equals V2. Now let's do the same, V3, we use these two right here. V3 equals two times the sine of 55.6 over M times the sine of 74.4, all times V1. So now we've got V2 and V3 in terms of V1. So let's plug these in to our energy equation. Let's cancel these first. V1 squared equals V2 squared. Well, that's just this thing. V1 squared sine squared 50 over sine of squared 74.4 plus 1 half times M times V3 squared, which is 4 sine squared there's a lot of work here. 55.6 times V1 squared over M squared sine squared 74.4. And every single term in this equation, V1 squared exists. So we can cancel all those out. Let me clear some space here. Let me write up here, actually. So if we cancel all those out, we have 1 equal to sine squared 50 over sine of squared 74.4 plus, as we can see here, these m's will cancel a bit, plus one half, actually this cancels out, we have a two up here, two times the sine squared, 55.6, uh-oh, 5.6 over m times the sine squared of 74.4. So I know this is a lot of work, but in the end, we have an equation with only m as our unknown. And if we solve for m, we'll get 4 kilograms. So that's the approach to solve a 2D elastic collision um, problem. Okay. So the first thing you do is you use the conservation of momentum. You add the momentum vectors together to make a triangle. Okay, 
And once you have that triangle, use the law of sines to have this combination, this equality right here. Let me highlight it. Use the law of sines to get this thing, okay? And once you have that, you represent uh, all three of these variables as one of the velocities. So in this case, I used it as V1, okay? So I turned V2 and V3 in terms of V1. And then we plug all of this in to the energy equation, because since in, in, in um, an elastic collision, energy is conserved. So we plug this in to our energy equation, and then we solve for M, okay? So that's the overall approach to um, an elastic collision, a 2D elastic collisions, all right? So are there any questions about this? All right, so um, I've kept you guys here long enough. So um, I do have one last problem for you guys to do, but maybe I'll just put that in the homework later on for you guys to do in the homework, all right? And I know this is a lot of stuff you need to consider, and these, this kind of problem is actually very challenging. If you remember back to the dynamics um, lesson, the last problem was also very challenging. So if you don't really understand this right now, you can watch the replay on YouTube later on, which will make it a little easier for you. But still, if you still don't understand this in the end, it really doesn't matter. This is actually a very challenging problem that maybe you'll review later on in your, um, in your high school physics class, for example. Okay, so let me stop sharing. And that's it for me, for me today, okay? So I'll see you guys later and have a good night. Bye. Thank you, bye.